welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the OnScript podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I'm joining you from Westminster Theological Center in the UK, and we are in the middle of a heat wave, at least by British standards, which means it's pretty hot, um, but not as hot as France right now, which just recorded the highest temperature ever in southern France at 45.9 Celsius, which is like 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, But do you know how to stay cool this summer? Well, two things you can do. First of all, you can join us on July 23rd at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin. And that's about 45 minutes west of Milwaukee. And we'll be recording a live episode with the very Reverend Dr. John Baer and our own Dr. Amy Brown-Hughes. And they'll be discussing things like patristics and origin and Athanasius and all kinds of interesting theological uh, uh, topics. So uh, both have really brilliant insights to bring to that subject. So it should be a really fun uh, event. It's going to be live, uh, recorded 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. Uh, on July 23rd. That's a Tuesday. And so uh, RSVP and register on our website, and that's all free. Uh, you might want to bring a few dollars for drinks, um, but uh, it's otherwise free. Second of all, second way to stay cool. Um, oh, and, and you stay cool on that first one but because the the room we're in is air conditioned and it's Wisconsin, so how bad can it get? Uh, second way, grab four to five friends and sit in a cool place and listen to an on-script episode. And because you're in a cool place, you'd think that would keep you cool, but that's not the thing that keeps you cool because you'd be listening to on-script and your brain would be sizzling hot by the end of the episode. Um, but then drink ice water at the end of the episode and you'll stay cool. See that? Free advice. Um, okay, for this, we have a very special episode today. Uh, Dr. Ellen Davis uh, from uh, Duke Divinity School, who is a giant in the field of biblical studies, and she's just written another brilliant book, Opening Israel's Scriptures, which uh, I, I really enjoyed. She's a prophet, poet, and sage, and I was thrilled to get the chance to speak with her. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back, on script listeners. Today we have as our guest Professor Ellen Davis, who is Amos Reagan Kearns Professor of Bible and Practical Theology at Duke Divinity School. She's the author of 11 books and many articles. Her books include Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, an Agrarian Reading of the Bible, Biblical Prophecy, Perspectives for Christian Theology, Discipleship and Ministry, and Wondrous Depth, Old Testament Preaching. Uh, Today we're discussing her newest book, Opening Israel's Scriptures, published by Oxford University Press in Uh, just this year, uh, which is a comprehensive theological uh, reading of the Hebrew Bible Old Testament. Professor Davis, welcome to OnScript. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, so I've been I've been bugging you for about a year um, in eager anticipation of of this book's publication. So, uh, it's really great to to have you on now. Now that the book is is published and we can do this. Um, so, what what one of the uh, kind of big picture questions I wanted to start out with was, uh, what is it that that captivates you about Israel's scriptures? It always seems to me a remarkable thing that these ancient texts from a world in countless ways, incalculably different from our own, speak to us with such immediacy when we find a way to open up that world and connect it with our own pressing concerns. And my experience is that when you slow down over the text and ask, what's in it for me? Um, or more, probably more to the point, what's in it for us? Because I think that um, certainly, ethically speaking, the Bible speaks to us as a community. When you look at it from that perspective, it never fails to be compelling. Hmm. 
And and what what was the kind of initial hook for you? What got you into uh, more serious study of the Bible, and, and in particular the the Old Testament? When I was eighteen, I was a classics major at the Univ- University of California in Berkeley. Um, when I was eighteen. I spent my junior year in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University, and I the first thing we did was study Hebrew, which I found utterly compelling, um, and and then just studying the Bible with excellent teachers in the land in which it was written, and the Bible is a very is very much oriented to the specific that specific space. Um, I just found it completely captivating, and returned to to Berkeley, n- not no longer terribly interested in studying classics, <laughs> and so I switched and. Um, and put together my Latin and my Hebrew and wrote my senior thesis under Robert Alter. Um, and then, and so it all, and then I put it aside for quite a number of years uh, before I returned to my own formal study of Bible. Mm, yeah, when I saw your UC Berkeley, I wondered if you had had uh, studied with uh, Robert Alter. So he was um, my who, teacher before he was Robert Alter, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, so he was just starting to dabble in these uh, narrative approaches to the Bible yes. at, at that time. Yeah. He was professor of comparative literature and I think he'd maybe published his first article on Bible, but was only, I went to him because he knew Hebrew, and there was no one else in comparative literature who could work across classical languages, you know, um, Latin and Greek and Hebrew. But he wasn't, we didn't think of him as a biblical scholar at that time. Right. Um, so so then you, you also studied um, at Oxford and at Yale and then taught at Yale, is that right? I did. Yeah. Um, so who, who were some of the other formative influences on you as a biblical scholar? Probably the single most important is Brevard Childs, who was my doctor father, um, and the person to whom, for whom I went to Yale. And at the time, I didn't realize that was 1983. And I didn't realize that in choosing to study with Brevard Childs, I probably had found the only major biblical scholar in the U.S. at that time who would have encouraged me to study theological exegesis and to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. I always wanted to interpret the Bible for religious communities, for for Jews and Christians. Um, and I didn't realize how um, how far that was from the goals of the academic guild um, at that time as it was. But Brevard Childs um, encouraged me to do what I wanted to do. And, and then as the years went on, um, Walter Brueggemann became a very important, he's never been my teacher, but a very important older colleague. Um, Phyllis Tribble was my colleague at my first teaching job, Union Theological Seminary in New York. Mm-hmm. And that someone who takes the text very seriously and asks a somewhat different set of questions than I do, but questions of contemporary relevance, that was very helpful to me mm. and encouraging. Yeah, so so you had um, so you had Brevard Childs that kind of influenced you around theological exegesis, and then Phyllis Tribble, Walter Brueggemann. Who who were the people, or how how did you get so interested in in the themes around ecology in the Bible? Because um, that that seems to come up repeatedly in what you do, and certainly uh, your book on uh, the agrarian reading of the Bible. Um, yeah, that wasn't the influence of any particular scholar. Um, 
it's a result of the fact probably that I, I'm a Californian, uh, so I grew up kind of half outdoors, and all my life, and I grew up in a very beautiful place, the San Francisco Bay Area, but also a very fragile place, which has changed hugely in my lifetime. And so when I was somewhere around the age of 40, I was living in New Haven, Connecticut, and a very urbanized area. And I'd made a visit to California, to a part of California, maybe 50 miles north of San Francisco, that I hadn't been to since I was a child. And it was shocking to me to see highways running across what I remembered as farmland. And that was the moment at which I suddenly realized that the trajectory that we were on in my lifetime was unsustainable. And when I compared that, again, I was about 40, when I compared what I had seen over less than four decades of adult of, of memory and and awareness, when I compared that to the something like four millennia that I was aware of in, in the Middle East, I realized this isn't going to work. Um, and so at that point, I came back. I was teaching at Yale Divinity School at the time. I came back and I decided I was going to start teaching a class on a biblical theology of land. Um, I also called it biblical ecology, not knowing really what either one of those things meant, but figuring that I I would just explore it and see what happened. And I began teaching that course thinking I would have to select very carefully to find texts that spoke to land issues, ecological issues, um, within a very short period of time probably no more than months, I realized virtually every page of the Hebrew Bible Old Testament speaks to issues of land, water, um, life, vegetation, animals. Um, and, and so that really began to change the focus of my teaching. No one had taught me to pay attention to things like that before. And actually, I should also say, that my students noticed it even before I did. Um, I was teaching the introductory course, year-long course, and one of my doctoral students, we were making up the midterm exam, and one of my doctoral students said, well, you need to ask a question on land. And I said, why? And he said, because you speak about it every lecture. And I was not, <laughs> I was not conscious of speaking about it. Um, but... And this was before we were really thinking about, this was around 1990, it was before we were thinking about agricultural issues um, and, and the depredations of industrial agriculture. Um, but I, I quickly realized that the point of connection between Hebrew Bible and contemporary concerns it had to have something to do with agriculture, even though I didn't know much about what that meant. And I um, I went to the undergraduate soil sciences section of the library at, at Yale because I knew the graduate library would be beyond me in that area, but I could manage the undergraduate library. And so I just read the shelves. And as I was scanning the titles, there was one that grabbed my attention, and it was called Meeting the Expectations of the Land. And I thought, at some inchoate level, I thought whoever came up with that title understood how the Bible thinks about land. And it was by Wes Jackson, and it was a collected um, essays and edited by Wes Jackson and Wendell Berry and Bruce Coleman. And shortly thereafter, I met uh, I met Wes Jackson, and then I began working with him, and then through him, I met Norman Wurzba and Wendell Berry, and, and they then guided me and told me if what I was writing and thinking 
and saying made sense and helped me see how it made sense in terms of all kinds of things I, of course, knew nothing about whatsoever. Um, so, and I'd like to I'd like to turn toward your book, um, uh, Opening Israel's Scriptures. So, uh, the 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 title to that book um, gets at something that that I've already heard in this interview, which is that you're you're speaking to uh, two different audiences in a way, or, or that you're reading with a with a view toward both Christian and Jewish audiences. And um, and I just wondered um, if you could talk about holding those two together as a biblical scholar. Um, do you feel like you're always directing to one audience or another, or are they is it primarily you're speaking with one voice to the same audience? same uh, readership or how do you how do you think about the interaction of those two it's it's a way of integrating something in my scholarship that I have been really working on since I was an undergraduate my as I said my first serious teachers in Bible were at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem so they were Jews so it was Jews who opened Israel scriptures for me. Uh, through the years, in f- formal and informal settings, many of my close companions um, in the study of scripture have been Jews, and then more recently, Muslims, um, reading with Muslims, reading Quran and Bible side by side. So this is something I've done in my teaching, in my avocational study for a long time. Some of my books, um, I hope and am grateful that some of my books have been useful uh, to Jewish readers. Um, And um, so no, I feel that if I'm I don't need to apologize for reading as a Christian, Um, and but I do feel that I need to be self-conscious that I read as a Christian, and so I I do try to show connections between my readings and New Testament the text of the New Testament and also Christian theological readings, and at the same time, to a much lesser extent, um, my readings are informed by the relatively little that I know about Jewish interpretive tradition. Um, But I want to open that door, and... um, and because I do a fairly close reading of text, it seems it seems to enable some Jewish interpreters in my acquaintance to do their work, which is a different kind of work than mine. Yeah, yeah, that's something that really came out in the book. It was just, uh, you're you know you're you're doing this kind of big picture look at the the um, Old Testament, but at the same time you have these close, careful readings of particular texts at times, um, and you're able to follow the trajectories of those texts into the Christian tradition and Jewish tradition. Um, and I wanted to ask you about another thing that, that you're holding together, and this comes out in the intro to the book, and that is a critical a biblical interpretation, so kind of critical scholarship, and then also a theological interpretation of the Bible. Um, how... Um, how are you bringing those two uh, things together? They're often they're often held apart or seen to stand in tension or even in contradiction with each other. I would say that good readings of the Bible in every age, including ancient times, are critical readings of the Bible. My understanding of what a critical reading is is a reading that is is self-aware, um, that recognizes the assumptions, the presuppositions that one is making, um, and is forthright about those, 
and also recognizes the complexity of the text, the open-endedness of the text. Um, it seems to me there's nothing less critical than trying to identify a single right forever reading of the Bible. Um, and it's um, and f fundamentalist Christians have no exclusive claim to that kind of reading. Um, many academic readers also look for the single monolithic reading of a text, which seems to me ultimately is is an uncritical reading because it does not allow the text to be as complex as in fact it is. Hmm. And I, I wanted to talk about uh, particular sections of the book. Um, there, I, I really in enjoyed um, the diversity of, of topics that you cover. And even though this is, you know, you're going book pretty much book by book through the the um, Old Testament, uh, you you deal with topics within each book that you feel are are relevant for today, which I really uh, enjoyed. Um, so, so one of them uh, that comes out in your your section on numbers has to do with Israel in the wilderness and the manna uh, economy of Israel. And this that that section of the the Bible, the wilderness, is often taught in terms of you know if you were to appropriate it for today in terms of learning to depend on God and not complain and and so on. Uh, but you you've explored the economic significance of this portion of the book. So so what are some um, aspects of, of that wilderness economy that you, you find so significant for today? I suppose the main thing I would identify is the recognition of necessary limits. Um, and maybe even prior to that, the recognition that eating is the primary economic act. So the first thing, even before we get to numbers, the first thing that happens when in Exodus, as soon as Israel has crossed the Reed Sea, the first thing they have to work out is how is everybody going to eat? And everybody can eat only if nobody takes too much. If nobody takes too much, then nobody will have too little. Um, that, it seems to me, is probably the major economic statement in the Bible. Um, and, and then, of course, what we discover, in, especially in the book of Numbers, is, but already in Exodus, that doesn't come naturally. Um, and so you have the story of, of people complaining, people taking too much, uh, God finally getting angry and sending a glut of quail, so there's quail up to people's armpits. It's you know it's a story of the the ugliness of greed, um, and um, and what I see in the Book of Numbers is stories of of presumption and how human presumption, how God responds to that um, at the level of the whole community, um, also at the level of leadership, so the stories of, um, of Korach and Datan and Abiram, um, presumption um, that, that they should be leaders in the community, and then ultimately Moses' own presumption that that finally even Moses has to die short of the promised land, uh, because at some point it seems he comes to think, however briefly, he comes to at least articulate um, the conviction that it depends upon him. Um, and so shall we bring forth water from this rock? Um, and so I think Numbers, which is not usually a favorite book amongst 
Christians, but I think it shows the dynamics of sin and especially the dynamics of of presumption um, and as um, as Carl Barth saw the dynamics of sloth um, of not as Carl Barth put it sloth is not rising to the high calling of God and and we see that through the stories in the book of Numbers but it takes it's a meandering book. They're wandering in the wilderness, and it, it takes patience to see that. Yeah, and what's the significance of all of that happening in the wilderness? You know, like, it, it, why, why do we need to read, or what happens when we read the story of the manna provision and the, um, you know, the presumptions w- within the leadership and, and all of that against the backdrop of the wilderness? Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a question I directly address, but one thing one might say is that we spend very much of our time in the wilderness, which is to say in situations in which we are not in control, uh, less than ideal situations. Um, And Israel's history is that it it gets into the land, it gets into what are meant to be ideal conditions for humans living in the presence of God. It gets into the land only to begin its long slide into exile, so back back into the wilderness, so to speak. And it's people who don't read the Bible often think of the Bible as being sort of idealistic, pie in the sky when you die. Um, I think the Bible is is more realistic than we can stand most of the time. And the, the stories of um, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until, um, until the old generation dies, um, that's pretty realistic and painfully yeah. so. Yeah. And, and it's also intrigued me that... Uh, Israel receives a law in the wilderness too. You know, they presumably that could have been given in the land, um, but the the law was given in the wilderness. Do you, do you have any thoughts on why that setting might be significant for that event? Absolutely. Um, everything that Israel needs to be a people living in the presence of God. Everything that's absolutely essential is given in the wilderness. Um, And and so the land is, it's a gift. It's something profoundly to be desired. Um, And at the same time, it... um, it's a gift that can be taken away, and Israel will still survive. Um, and so I think, I think that's a crucial message. Certainly, Jews have understood that to be a crucial message for their own survival. It has not taken away the intense desire to be in the land and the recognition that... Um, that the full performance of Torah is only possible in the land. Torah is always aiming at the land, and yet, um, and that, and yet, recognizing the conditionality of the land. And I think that's a, a message that Christians need to reckon with. Also, the Bible is more aspirational than it is. Um, an expression of contentment. Um, and um, and that's something that I think both our theological traditions have to reckon with seriously. It, it, aspirational in the sense that it's, it's written from the perspective of people longing for another reality or more fuller reality. Um, yeah. I mean, I, Ev- yeah. Every ending of the Bible whether it's the ending of Genesis 
the ending of, or every major ending, the ending of Genesis, the ending of Torah, um, the ending of the Christian Bible with, um, or the ending of the Christian Old Testament with Malachi, the ending of the Hebrew Bible altogether with the Book of Chronicles, and the ending of the Christian Bible in both Testaments with Revelation. All of it ends looking for what's beyond. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And, and um, you know, speaking of that aspiration for the land, so one of the, the themes that came up uh, at a number of points in your book was the the challenges around violence in the Old Testament. And and I saw this in your reading of, of some of the um, laws regarding the extermination of Canaanites in the book of Deuteronomy in, in 7 and 20, and then uh, in your reading of, of the book of Joshua as well. So um, I, I thought maybe it'd be good to just hear from you about some of the ways that you've wrestled through the those really strange, stark and um, seemingly genocidal texts uh, regarding the Canaanites in Deuteronomy and then how you read Joshua? Not everybody would agree with my reading, um, and it's a difficult reading. The starting point for my reading is that Israel is doing theology. The Bible is being written from a perspective of geopolitical weakness rather than strength. Um, Israel was on the losing side of most conflicts through most of its history. And so when I teach, I always keep a map in front of my students' eyes because you have to remember that Israel, Judah, Yehud, is a pin dot on the scroll of empire. Reading with that awareness um, of a disempowered people, um, I see the, um, the imperative to exterminate the Canaanites as an imperative for Israel to separate itself from the dominant culture. Um, and, and we now have um, a fairly wide consensus amongst archaeologists and historians that that's exactly how Israel came into being by people in probably initially small numbers separating themselves from the dominant culture of Canaanites under the thumb of New Kingdom Egypt and gradually settling in the whole country in very small villages. Um, and, um, and a new kind of religious awareness emerging and being a strong part of the impetus for that. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then exterminating the Canaanites by the time Deuteronomy is writing in the 7th century. Canaanites as city-states, that's history from half a millennium before. Um, and, um, and Israel is under the thumb of the great empire. The, um, in the seventh century, it's the Assyrians who are the dominant power. Well, Israel isn't going to exterminate the Assyrians. Uh, but I would read that as a as a call for social and religious, if not if not full, if full social separation wasn't possible, um, religious integrity, um, and and again I would see something like the Book of Esther uh, in the period of the Persian Empire. Um, I see that as a kind of fantasy. Um, 
what would it be like if for you know if history were turned on its head and suddenly everybody wanted to pretend to be Jews because it was safer <laughs> um what would it be like if Jews had swords in their hands instead of at their throats in somebody else's hands? Just imagine that. Um, and, and these books are giving you certain hints that this is a kind of historical fantasy, a kind of countertale. Hmm. Yeah, your, your section on Esther was interesting in all the... Um, th- the the hyperbolic elements that you bring out in that in that story that that suggest a particular genre designation can't remember what you called it but um the kind of alaska i think probably. yeah yeah and um you know you have this this pole that um you know Haman is hanged on that he set up uh, for Haman and it's 75 feet high you know that's a that's a heck of a pole um and in and, and a number of other elements in the story that are, are ways the author is hinting to you to, that this is meant to be read in a particular way. Um, and uh, Deuteronomy uh, strikes me as a, as a book that, um, you know, at, at one level can be read as a straightforward call to destroy the Canaanites. But then when you look at, uh, I think you pointed this out in the book too, when, when Josiah goes to implement the the Deuteronomic agenda, he destroys altars and sites of worship, and he's not going around exterminating whole populations. Um, uh, you know, a few priests certainly got it, but uh, other than that, it, you know, this is this is about um, religious differentiation from the local uh, practices. Um, yeah, so I th- I, th- I think those those parts of your book are really helpful, and it seems like something you you come back to a number of times. I, I wanted to uh, ask a few intermission questions, uh, if I could. Um, these can uh, I'll go through them pretty uh, briefly, and we we tend to ask these of every guest that comes on. So I'm curious to hear your your responses. So, what do you consider the most significant book in biblical studies in the last fifty years? Wow. Um, I, that's an impossible question. Yeah. Um, but I will say that one book that I think made a big difference, including for me, um, is Brevard Child's introdu- Introduction to the Old Testament of Scripture. Um, it's not the kind of book that you read straight through and it's not and it's really a book that was written for scholars but it it did a couple of things and i'm i'm going to mention two books um it did a um it did a couple of things one it oriented us toward the fact that there it still makes sense and it's still imperative to think about the Bible as scripture. Um, And that it was shaped as a whole. Ultimately, it was shaped as a whole. That book also oriented us toward reading books as a whole. I think that is one of the crucial moves that's happened in biblical studies, Um, moving away from more atomistic readings of Scripture or more thematic readings of Scripture, looking for, um, of course, it makes sense to look for threads that run all the way through, but reminding us that Scripture is organized by books and those books have a shape. That was hugely influential, probably the way in which Brevard Childs most influenced me as his student and later his colleague. The other, here it's very hard to identify one book from someone who's written so many, but I think that Walter Brueggemann um, has had an, um, an unquestionably enormous um, 
impact upon the way especially Christians read scripture, uh, much less so amongst Jews. And so one could pick um, any number of his 120 or so books. Um, but I would say that the prophetic imagination, and one that I returned to most recently in an essay, The Land, which was written in 1978, I believe, um, uh, 78 or 79, so a biblical period of about 40 years ago. Um, and that's where he's really beginning to move to a new kind of critical thinking and is um, is looking at the significance of land, um, which to my view is is one of the most crucial moves that has been made in rethinking how we read scripture. He's not doing it from an ecological perspective, but he is doing it in both of those books, uh, The Land and Prophetic Imagination. He's doing what he's continued to do all through the years, reading with his eye trained on questions of power. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very significant. Yeah. Excellent. Um, what's one idea in biblical studies that you think needs to die? The idea that the theological questions can be taken out of consideration of the Bible and you have much of anything left. Um, and also the idea that religion, theology, um, are separate concerns from political concerns, economic concerns, that we can read the Bible. I guess I'm giving you more than one answer. <laughs> Several things have to die. The idea that we can read the Bible as um, individuals, so that it's just about God and little me. It's it's inevitably produces poor readings. Are you able to pinpoint uh, a, a defining conversation that you've had over your years of, of teaching the Old Testament? Not a single conversation, um, but a, a, a sort of extended moment. In 1996, I was beginning to teach at Virginia Theological Seminary. And that year, my first year there, I had in my Old Testament interpretation class um, two bishops from East Africa, um, bishops who later became archbishops, uh, Emmanuel Colini of Rwanda and Emmanuel Dengbol Yak of Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, they were what in the Episcopal Church we call baby bishops at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but they had left dioceses in very acute, um, it, traumatic situations. Um, again, it was 1996. It was two years after the genocide in Rwanda. Um, and it was in the height of the genocide in in what was then Sudan. There was no South Sudan. And these bishops had left not only their diocese, but they had left their families um, to come and study Bible, and both of them, it, it, to study at Virginia Seminary, but for both of them, Bible was their priority, especially Arch Bishop Daniel from mm -hmm. Sudan. He said, we live in the Old Testament. Our people my people need to know their story. Um, and so I was at that point, I was about 10 years into my own teaching, so enough to make some decisions, some informed decisions. And I realized that if what I said as the lecturer didn't make any difference to those two people, then, it, then how much could it really matter? 
So it sort of forced me to think about the question that I hope is in the background of every one of the essays in this book. Mm. So what? Why does it matter? Why should we read carefully? And I will never forget Archbishop, eventually Archbishop Daniel, then Bishop Daniel, saying to me, I've never before read the Bible critically. And to hear that from someone who had probably, before coming to Virginia Seminary, no more than a few weeks of formal theological education, um, and who had never been to a school that was not destroyed in the time that he was there. So um, p perhaps had never completed a year of schooling without interruption. To hear him speak about what it meant to him to study the Bible critically made me think about what does it mean to read the Bible critically. And it certainly for him did not mean that sorting out J, E, P, and D in a definitive mm. way. Yeah. That was not going to be very helpful to his people. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask what, what he meant by reading critically. What do you think that, th that meant for him? I think it meant, as I said before, recognizing the complexity of it, recognizing that there are ways to connect the Bible responsibly to our own lives, um, that, but there are better and worse ways to do that. And through many years then subsequently of teaching in Sudan, what I learned was that the missionaries taught people who were converting to Christianity, they taught them to read the Bible purely as individuals looking for, for the salvation of their own individual soul. And, and as I tried to help them connect the Bible to the political, economic, geophysical realities of their lives, which of course were dominating the life, do dominate the life of every person in a Sudanese village, um, um, as I helped them think in those terms, they said, no one has ever helped us read the Bible in this way before. And that was much more native territory for them because they didn't grow up as they're not Western individualists. Um, and they, they relate to a kinship-based society in which, no, in which no important decision is made by an individual. Um, but thinking about what those Iron Age accounts given in the text, how those relate to 20th, 21st century situations, and how to draw the lines of connection in responsible ways. That, I think, is what Bishop Daniel meant by a critical reading of Scripture. Yeah. So it's as much a, a critical reading of their own, maybe inherited ways of reading the Bible, and then a, a coming home to the, the Bible's own world. Um, uh, we're we're running short on time. There's one other uh, section I just wanted to ask you about, and that is uh, lament. Um, you know, we were just at a, a poetry conference in in Durham here in England, and that was a, a topic that came up on a number of occasions, including in your own uh, paper. And that's it's in many ways still an unfamiliar practice in large parts of the church, despite I think efforts to. Um, recover or discover a lament. Um, so, what do you what do you think is the wisdom and need? Um, of, what's the wisdom of lament? To use the phrase you use in the chapter, um, what's what's needed uh, that lament gives us in in the church? I think lament is one step on a very long journey toward healing. Um, and 
psychic healing, healing of the community. Lament, as we see it in the Psalms, as we see it in in prophets, in the Book of Lamentations, of course, um, as it runs uh, through the New Testament and um, especially prominent in the Book of Revelation, but also Jesus' cry from the cross and so on. Um, Lament is, it doesn't aim at a solution to a problem. It aims at the articulation of pain, um, physical pain, social pain, spiritual pain, um, with the conviction that this is not just whining, Mm -hmm. but meaningful communication, that, that someone is listening. And and that someone who is listening is is an audience composed of both humans, humans through, in fact, through the generations, um, and and God. God is listening. God is not always fixing in the immediate. Um, but somehow that awareness of being heard, of being cared about, of being suffered with, I think lament aims in part at compassion, at suffering with. And there is healing in that. Um, There is... The word that's coming to my mind um, is is endurance. Hupomene in Greek, um, simply enduring, is that's that's part of the witness of of the Bible, um, and so lament is it's on a trajectory. Um, the the goal is praise. Uh, not every lament gets there. Some of them get there and are not able to sustain it. And again, that's that's part of the reality of the witness of the Bible. Um, but that the Bible equips us to articulate um, that pain and gives us so many different ways, so many different settings in which that articulation is appropriate. That's a crucial wisdom wisdom that I think we have too easily forfeited. Um, At least Christians have forfeited that too easily in our liturgical lives. Hmm. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for for taking the time to speak with me today about your book, Opening Israel's Scriptures. And we've just scratched the surface of so many uh, really compelling uh, parts of the book. And I really appreciate it, too, how you, it, it wasn't just a standard survey of the Old Testament, um, but yet can be used in that capacity. Um, you've you've shown how to read with Christians and and Jews throughout the ages with uh, East African um, uh, Christians and different authors that you've read throughout the years. So I really uh, have have uh, appreciated and enjoyed this book, and uh, I want to commend it to our listeners as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study donate.